Hello my precious friends, I really hope that you are doing great. Welcome to our fourth and last lesson on the sixth topic of Form 3 work which is called Webs 2. As usual, let me comment by giving you the quote of the day which states that real life is never a plateau, rather it's a combination of valleys and mountains. We shall discuss that quote at the end of our class today. So today we are continuing with the fourth property of wave which was interference of waves. So remember in our previous class we did look at uh, interference in sound waves. So today we are looking at interference in light. So in light interference produces what we call the bright and dark fringes when the source of light is monochromatic. The word mono means one then chromatic means color. Therefore a monochromatic source of light is a source of light that produces light of a specific color just one color however when the white light is used as the source of light then interference is going to produce what we call colored bands for example when we use white light we know that uh, after diffraction we are going to have the seven colors of the spectrum which are red orange yellow green blue indigo and violet as we saw in uh, refraction of light so you you can just review our lessons on refraction of light which was I think our second topic under form 3 work. So to investigate that we use what we call the Young's double slit experiment. So double slit because it has some two gaps or two slits that is S1 and S2. So the Young's double slit experiment can be used to demonstrate interference in light as shown below. So one we have um, our source of light which is monochromatic light so we expect formation of bright and dark fringes. So we have our source S1 which is producing a monochromatic light that is having a specific color. For example in this case we are using the purple color. So once this light is refracted through the first slit when it gets to the second uh, slit that is S1 and S2 it is also diffracted the second time. So the slit S1 diffracts the light so these particular wave fronts that are in color uh, green represent the wave fronts for the light has been that has been refracted by our slit S1. Then slit S2 will also diffract the same same light. So the wave fronts which are in color blue represent uh, the wave fronts which have been or the light which has been diffracted through the slit S2. So you can see at the end here we are going to have formation of bright fringes and dark fringes. So we are going to have alternating bright and dark fringes. Just like in sound waves whereby we had formation of loud sound and uh, soft sound. So also in uh, light instead of the uh, soft sound we have what we call the dark fringes then instead of the loud sound we have what we call bright fringes. So that tells you that bright fringes will always be formed when the waves interfere constructively. Then dark fringes are going to be formed when the waves interfere destructively. Then in between, in between that is the line that is uh, at the midpoint of the speakers S1 and S2 that is the locus of points uh, which are equidistant from speakers S1 and S2 we are going to have what we call a central bright fringe that is in between the two speakers because the light waves produced by that is the slits S1 and S2 in between so in between them we are going to have what we call constructive interference of the light waves from uh, the source the slit S1 and S2 so in between we are going to have a central bright fringe just like in a sound whereby in between we had a loud sound all through so we have the regions so assuming let's consider these particular two uh, dotted lines so if we continue extrapolating these dotted lines they are going to meet somewhere around here so at that particular region where they meet we are going to have formation of a bright fringe which we are denoting by a point P. So if we extrapolate the point P to our diagram here this is our P then in between in between the bright fringes we are going to have a dark fringe which we are denoting by point R. So assuming this is our R that is the dark fringe we want to investigate the path differences. So for a bright fringe to form the path difference must be equal to one wavelength. So for example, the, let's consider the bright fringe at point P. The path difference you will simply take the source, the distance from the source that is S2 up to P minus the distance from the source S1 up to P. So the path difference will just be 6 centimeters minus 2 centimeters to give us a bright fringe. So in an exam situation you will be told to uh, state the path that will lead to formation of a bright fringe. So the bright fringe will be formed if the path difference is one wavelength. 
For example, in this case, the path difference will be 6 centimeters minus 2 centimeters, which of course will give us 4 centimeters. So whenever the path difference is one wavelength, then we are going to have the formation of what we call a bright fringe. Then for a dark fringe to form, the path difference must be equal to a half a wavelength. Remember the dark fringe usually occurs in between the bright fringes, such that if we have a bright fringe at point P, then we have another bright fringe at point O, then in between, in between point P and O, assuming maybe O is somewhere here, so in between point P and O, we are going to have what we call a dark fringe, because as you can see here, the bright and the dark fringe are alternating each other. So the path difference that forms a dark fringe, that is the path difference from S2 up to R minus the path of S1 up to R, which is just 4 cm minus 1 cm. That, if that path difference is equal to a half a wavelength, then we are going to have the formation of a dark fringe. So a dark fringe is formed when the path difference is equal to half of the wavelength. So in this case, the path difference that gives us a dark fringe is the distance from the source, the slit S2, up to R where the dark fringe is formed. So this particular distance here, four centimeter, then the difference minus S1 up to R, that is the one centimeter. So that is equals to half the wavelength. So in that case, we are going to have formation of a dark fringe. So you'll also be asked to state the path difference that must be formed in order for there to be a dark fringe. For example, in this case, if this was four centimeter, then this was one centimeter, then the path difference will be four minus one, which is actually three centimeters. Next. Next, we are looking at stationary waves, also called standing waves. So a stationary wave is usually formed when two equal progressive waves traveling in opposite directions are superposed on each other. So superposed simply means that the waves are canceling each other because they are traveling in opposite direction. And of course, they are out of phase, that is in standing waves. Then uh, the stationary waves are us usually occur in stringed instrument, for example, in a guitar. So a stationary wave is usually characterized by antinodes, denoted by capital A, which simply refers to points of maximum amplitude or maximum displacement. Then we have, it also has the points called the nodes, which we denote by capital N, which refers to the points of minimum uh, amplitude or the points of zero displacement. So for example here, in this particular wave of ours, this is a node that is a point of minimum displacement because along this particular line, the displacement is actually zero. So you can see the nodes at uh, have a displacement of zero. So the nodes are here. We have another node here. We have another node here. However, the points of maximum amplitude or um, if it was in progressive waves, you could be talking of actually the crests. So the crests in progressive waves, when we come to stationary waves, we represent them by an antinode. So antinodes are simply points of maximum displacement. So these are our first antinode, these are our second antinode, the third antinode, and so on and so forth. So antinodes are actually points of maximum displacement on a stationary waves, but uh, the nodes are points of minimum displacement on a stationary wave or points of zero displacement. If we were talking of um, a progressive wave, as we looked as as we looked at it in under uh, waves one, we did say that for progressive waves are usually characterized by crests and troughs, but for stationary waves they are characterized by antinodes and nodes, whereby the antinodes coincide with the crests that is in our uh, waves one, then or in progressive waves. Then the distance between successive nodes or successive antinodes is usually equal to half the wavelength. So you can see clearly here, remember our wavelength is usually formed when we have a complete oscillation. For example, in this case, from 0 0.5 uh, seconds from here up to this point, we are having half an oscillation plus another half an oscillation, we form a complete one oscillation. Similarly, for this other dotted wave from this particular point, this is a semicircle plus another semicircle, we form one complete oscillation or one complete cycle. So the distance that uh, is taken to form one complete oscillation is the wavelength. That is what we defined as the wavelength that is in uh, progressive waves. So it simply shows us that in this particular case, you can see the distance from one node to the next node. So from uh, this point up to the next point, we are having a semicircle. So that is simply half of the cycle, which is just half the wavelength. Therefore, the distance between any two successive nodes will give you half of the wavelength. You can see this one is half of 
this particular wavelength, which is the whole length that is forming a complete oscillation. Similarly, the distance between any two successive antinodes will also be equal to half of the wavelength. So the distance n to n, so node to node, is equal to the distance from antinode to an antinode, which is equal to half of the wavelength. Then you also need to know the conditions necessary for the formation of um, a, a stationary wave by two progressive waves which are traveling in opposite direction. So for any two progressive waves traveling in opposite directions to form a stationary wave, they must have the following property. One is that the two progressive waves must be traveling at the same speed. So assuming maybe this one is traveling at 20 meters per second, the second wave must also be traveling at 20 meters per second in order for them to form a stationary wave. Then that the two progressive waves must have the same frequency. Remember frequency is just the number of oscillations made in a second. For example, in this particular case, this is our one second. So you can see in one second, we have, this is a half a cycle plus another half a cycle. So we have one cycle. So in this case, the first wave here uh, that is in uh, color blue is having a frequency of one because it is forming one complete oscillation in one second. Similarly, the wave that is dotted or that is in color green is also forming, this is a semicircle plus another half a cycle, it gives us one complete oscillation. So it is also forming one complete cycle after one second. So it means that its frequency is also one. So you can see that our two waves have the same frequency. That's why they are forming a stationary or a standing wave. Then the third and last property is that uh, the two waves must have the same or nearly equal amplitudes in order for them to form a stationary uh, wave. You can see the amplitude of our, our first wave is one meter. The amplitude of the second wave is also one meter. Remember when we talk of the amplitude, amplitude is a, a scalar, that is, uh, yeah, it is a scalar quantity. Therefore, we don't consider the aspect of direction. We only look at the magnitude and the magnitude in this case is one meter. Lastly, let's look at the properties of stationary waves or standing waves. The first property is that uh, the stationary waves produced by, they are usually produced by superposition of two waves when a, a traveling wave is reflected uh, back along its incident uh, path. Then the second property is that um, for the formation of uh, stationary waves is that it has nodes at points of zero displacement and antinodes at points of maximum displacement. Remember, zero displacement simply means the minimum displacement. Then, uh, yeah, the maximum displacement is just the maximum amplitude. Then the third property for stationary waves is that the vibration of particles at points between successive nodes must be in phase. Then the fourth property is that um, between successive nodes, particles have different amplitudes of vibration. Then lastly, for the property for stationary wave is that the distance between successive nodes or antinodes is half the wavelength as we have just seen in our previous slide. Then, of course, lastly, let's look at the differences between stationary waves and progressive waves. Remember progressive waves, we looked at progressive waves in uh, waves one. So you can just review our lessons on uh, waves one, that is which was a form two topic, that is where we discussed progressive waves. So the differences between stationary or standing waves and progressive waves is that one, the stationary waves, the forms, are, that is the forms do not, the, the waveforms do not move through the medium and therefore the energy is not transferred from the source to some point away. But for progressive waves, the waveforms move through the medium away from its source and therefore the energy is usually transferred from the source to some point away. Then uh, the second difference is that for stationary wave, the distance between two successive nodes or antinodes is half of the wavelength, but for progressive waves, the distance between successive troughs or crests is equal to one wavelength. Yeah, remember we said that for progressive waves, they're usually defined by troughs and crests, but for stationary waves, they're usually defined by nodes and antinodes. Remember the crests in um, progressive waves were the points of uh, the maximum displacement, but the troughs were points of minimum displacement. Then for this particular case, this for stationary waves, the actually the antinodes uh, correspond to the crests. The antinodes correspond to the crests because the antinodes for stationary waves are now the points of maximum amplitude or maximum displacement. Also for progressive waves, the crests were points of maximum amplitude or maximum 
displacement that is from the mean position. Then the fourth difference is that for stationary wave, vibrations of particles at points between successive nodes are usually in phase. But for progressive waves, phases of particles near each other are usually different. Then lastly, for stationary waves, the amplitudes of particles between successive nodes are different, but for progressive waves, the amplitudes of any two particles which are in phase are usually the same. So we've come to the end of our class today, but we need to discuss the quote of the day. The quote of the day stated that real life is never a plateau. Rather, it's a combination of valleys and mountains. It is a combination of valleys and mountains. So the quote is preparing us to be psychologically ready for the tough and good moments in life. That is the value, the, the valleys, uh, which are the, uh, the low moments or the tough moments, and the mountains, which are simply represents uh, the happiness or the moments of happiness. Remember that just in the same way, the earth surface has valleys and plateaus and mountains. Real life will always have moments of happiness and sadness. Furthermore, do not forget that valleys in that is valleys um that is the valleys in uh, real life are there to create us to to create for us enough potential energy that will be converted to kinetic energy in order to help us to climb the mountains of life yeah when you are in the low moments that is when you develop your character that is when you develop your attitude in order uh to conquer any tough moments so that you can become successful. So the low moments or the valleys are very important for character development because once your character is developed, now uh, you have the components that are necessary for your future success. And lastly, recall that the best view is always achieved at the top of a mountain. Therefore, do not be afraid to climb the mountains of life. So do not be afraid to go through tough moments of life because they are always going to uh, sharpen you and to develop your character and help you to develop the mindset uh, that is very essential for you to handle the tough moments of life and become a great person in future. Thank you very much for accompanying me until the end of this particular lesson. I do not take it for granted. In case you're new to the channel, kindly hit the subscription button and also turn on the notification bell so that whenever I upload a new video, you'll get notified. So this was our last lesson on Waves 2. And of course, whatever I've covered here, that is what your syllabus requires us to cover. So in case you are new to the channel, kindly hit the subscription button. Uh, in case you know any student or anyone that you honestly think could benefit from this content, kindly refer them to Kind Tuition Academy or just share my link to them. Until next time, this is Kind Tuition Academy.